Howard preached on uh, Ephesians chapter 6. The weapon, the armour, putting on the, the full armour of God. And, and Howard made it very clear that uh, you put on the armour, which of course is protection, but it's to go into battle. We're not, uh, you know, you know when, when I was young, hallelujah, we used to have these cowboy films on television. And they'd all be there in the fort. And the Indians were surrounding the fort. And they were there desperately waiting for the, the cavalry to come to, to rescue them. Well, that's not the situation that we're in. This isn't a little fortress in the middle of, of the Indian territory. <laughs> waiting for the cavalry to come and rescue us. We are going to battle. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 11 to 16. But you, O man of God, and if you want, you, but you, O woman of God, flee these things that Paul's been talking about. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you, in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Jesus Christ, who himself witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep his commandment without spot, blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is blessed, the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone, alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, to whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. Fight the good fight. We're in a battle, folks. We're in a battle. Three things you need to know. Know your enemy. Know your commanding officer. Know your weapons. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. Again, going back to Howard's message at the beginning of the year, we are not fighting flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spiritual forces of darkness. In, in Uganda, many of, the, many of the people remember the days when the country was ruled by Idi Amin. You'll have heard of him. He was a despot. He, uh, I, I really don't quite work out the, where, where this one came in, but there's a film about it called The Last King of Scotland, and that's Idi Amin. He, he was crazy, but he was a despot, and the Christians were persecuted. He was a Muslim in theory. Um, so much so, when he died, they, they, they buried him in Mecca, for crying out loud. Um, but he persecuted Christians, and especially Christians like us, sort of Pentecostal, evangelical, full gospel. The, the, sort of, the Church of England was, was, was got away with it. But anything that was at all sort of enthusiastic and exciting and seeking to win people for Christ was persecuted. And so the, the churches went underground. And when he eventually Idi Amin fell, guess what? The church had blossomed. It was many, many times bigger than it was at the beginning. Because they knew they weren't fighting Idi Amin. They weren't fighting flesh and blood. They were fighting spiritual powers. Today, one of the, the, the great problems that's faced by Christians in many parts of the world, ISIS creating havoc all over the world. Al-Qaeda, groups like that. We're not fighting them. They're not the enemy. We are fighting the devil. Satan, he is our enemy. In, in, in the Western world, frankly, you know, people, people are sort of terrified of, of the growth of Islam. In one sense, the greatest threat, I believe, is, is atheism. It's irreligion and secularism. But that's, that's not our enemy. 
Our enemy is the devil. That's who we're fighting, not, not the bureaucratic red tape. You know, I mean, as, as churches, what we, we, as increasingly we're going to find. You know, red tape, when we want to do things, we want to do this, we want to do that, or the other, there's rules and regulations, do this, you've got to do it that way, fill this form in five times over, and go to this committee and that committee. That's not the enemy. The enemy is the devil. We are fighting supernatural powers of evil which put on a thousand different disguises, use a, a whole variety of different people, but it's not the people, it's the powers behind those people that we are seeking to overthrow. And we're, we're in a battle against those things. Make sure you know who you're fighting. Make sure you know who you're fighting. Know your commanding officer, Joshua, Chapter 5, Joshua was there ready to start taking over the, the promised land. And suddenly, there he's confronted with this soldier in uniform, with spear and sword. And he said, hey mate, whose side are you on? And he says, nobody's. You're on my side. <laughs> I'm in charge. I'm the commander of the Lord's armies. Make sure you know who's in charge. We have elders, we have deacons in this church. Hallelujah. We do our best, but we're not in charge. Jesus is in charge. Jesus. And we need to be sure that we know that he's the head of the church. He's the one who, who's the boss. We... Uh, we were watching uh, YouTube on Wednesday. Oh, he, he was. Well, I, I was on telly. <laughs> uh, David and Julie said, don't ask me how you do it, but he got, he got YouTube up. <laughs> and the, uh, the, 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 the last Soul Cafe we did, um, when was it? The one where we sort of welcoming everybody to church. And I, I was there welcoming everybody to church, but actually throwing everybody out. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, you know, and we, we, we tried to put across the message, and I must say, I, I was quite impressed. I thought he came across very well. Uh, Jesus is head of the church. He decides what we do. I mean, in the drama, he decides who comes. <laughs> but he decides what we do. He decides how we run the church. He is the commander of the Lord's army. Make sure you know him. Make sure you know him. Now again, going back even before my time, during World War II, I rather gather that uh, Montgomery in North Africa, the men who served under him felt they knew the guy. He, ha he had the kind of personality that came across. He wasn't just a, a general issuing orders. The men who were fighting under him felt that they knew the guy. We know that guy, he's, 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 he's for us. He's not just some faceless bureaucrat issuing orders. He, he is a bloke, and we can, we can obey him, we can go but follow him, we can stand but get behind him, and where he leads, we'll go. And they conquered North Africa during World War II. Make sure you know the commanding officer, that you know Jesus. A personal relationship with the guy. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Make sure you're recognizing the voice of Jesus. So that when he gives orders, you're not sort of, well, was that right? Was that Jesus? Was that somebody else? Was that the devil? Was that myself? We recognize the voice of Jesus. We know. That means spending time with him. Spending time in worship. That's why we're here. Spending time in prayer. Spending time in the Word of God. Getting into the Bible. Why, why we put so much emphasis on prayer and the Bible and worship? Don't, don't, that, you know, listen, if you don't do anything else in this fellowship, make sure you come to worship, you come to prayer, you come to Bible study. That, that, that's, that's the heart that we can get to know Jesus. 
to know him personally so that when he gives the orders we're ready to go hallelujah and then the third thing know your weapons Fair armory, there in the. Oh, I got that off the internet. <laughs> Goodness knows where, where he came from. <laughs> in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The weapons of our warfare, they're not guns and all that kind of stuff but we have got weapons and we need to know our weapons again I, I was uh, I, I was never in the army I, I, I only missed conscription by a few years I don't know whether Jack did you get called up no you missed it as well did you but uh, certainly people who are a little bit older you, no Dan, Danny I, I just, just missed it you see we just yeah, <laughs> but uh, those who were even older than me, Danny and, and Jack, actually got called up, and you went to war. Well, you didn't go to war. You went. You, we joined the army, and I rather gather that there was absolutely nothing to do, and they spent two years hanging around <laughs> doing nothing. <laughs> but one thing you had to do in the army: you had to know your weapons. You had to know how to dismantle a gun and put it back together again. I think I would have been great at dismantling it. <laughs> and then thought, oh, that's wonderful. I wonder where all these bits go. <laughs> but you need, to, you need to know your weapons. You need to know how to use them. You need to know what they do. You need to know how they work. You need to know your weapons. And that is, that, that is the main message I want to share with you this morning. To know your weapons. Howard spoke about the, the armour which is made of protection. I want to talk about the weapons that we have to take to the enemy, to get in there and fight. Weapon number one, praise. Praise. When we praise God, we are in warfare. Do you know the story of, of um, Jehoshaphat? Not, not, I've, never, I've, I've, I've never met a child that the, the parents say, Can you, we're going to call him Jehoshaphat. I don't know, Margaret, have you had a christened a Jehoshaphat? No, no, I, I haven't. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> no, no, I've never buried a Jehoshaphat either. No, but, uh, but he was king in, Je in Jerusalem. And he was uh, surrounded, the enemy were coming from three different sides. People were coming to attack him. And he said, Lord, what must I do? And again, Lord, what must I do? He sought the Lord. And the Lord said, get out there. But put the choir in front. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our choir's disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> David, you're on your own. <laughs> Beth is still lurking there. Hallelujah. So we've got, to get, we've got two guitars. Peter's there with the keyboard. Don't know how you're going to get that taken into battle with you, but there you are. Hallelujah. But get the musicians, the singers, the choir. Get them in front. And as soon as they began to praise the Lord, God began to work. And the enemy, these three different armies, coming from all different sides, started fighting one another. And by the time the army of Jerusalem got to the battlefield, they were all dead. God had dealt with it because they'd begun with praise. Praise is a powerful weapon. When we are praising God in this building, we can hear if we sing really loud, I suspect people outside might hear us. I, I, I do remember when we were at the Bateman Center, the, the vicar's wife, because uh, she, she, she walked down to church and she, she walked past the Bateman Center at half past ten as we were in there. She, could always, she said she could always hear us singing. So it may be people walking past here can hear us singing. But I tell you, there's somebody else who can hear us singing. The devil. Hallelujah. Principalities and powers can hear us praising God. And as we praise God, we are affecting the spiritual atmosphere of the whole neighborhood. We're not, we're not just singing songs for the sake of singing songs. We're singing praise to God. And that praise is a weapon 
that we are using. Hallelujah. Paul and Silas were, were in prison. In Acts chapter 16. They'd been accused, well, they'd, they'd been found guilty of casting a demon out of this young woman who was telling fortunes. They cast the demon out, now she can't tell fortunes. Hallelujah. And naturally the owners of the girl, because she was a slave, got upset. And they were influential people. Paul and Silas got slung into prison, down into the dungeons, locked and chained. And what did they do? Began singing. Hallelujah. Now they must have been absolutely awful singers because of an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> But baby, but, but they were praising God. They were like, oh, woe is us, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh, what shall we do now? Look where this is God, we must stop doing it. No, they praised God. And as they praised God, God shook the building. The chains fell off, the doors flew open, and they were free. And the, prison, the, the, the prison officer, the jailer, got saved. Hallelujah. Praise is a powerful weapon. We need to know that we've got to use it to, to, to attack the devil. The Word of God. Now this comes up in Ephesians chapter 6. We looked at part of the armour of God is the sword. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Bible. Again, the Bible. We need to know the Bible. We need to get into it and understand it. That's, that's, to, to, you need to know the Bible, you need to understand it. Then, of course, you need to live it. Sharper than a two-edged sword, it says in Hebrews. Jesus. When Jesus was confronted by the devil, the devil was tempt him, tempting him to turn away from the path that he was on. Because that's the heart of the temptations. Jesus had come to, to serve, to live, to die, to offer himself as, as a sacrifice. And... The devil was doing everything he could to turn Jesus away from that path of the cross. Jesus, what did he do? He says, listen, devil, it's all in here. Now, listen, the devil said, you're right, it is. What about this bit? And Jesus again answered from Scripture. He fought the devil with Scripture, the Word of God. Know the Word of God. Get to know what it says. Get to know what it means. Get to understand it and use it. Use it as a weapon. When you're under attack, get your Bible out. Get your sword out and attack the devil using the word of God. It's what Jesus did and it's what we too need to do. The name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Mark chapter 16, Jesus said, In my name they will cast out demons. In my name. It's in my name that people will, Christians, will have victory over the power of the devil because the name of Jesus is powerful. Just simply to say the name of Jesus. Sometimes, you know, in desperation, when people are under, under attack, all they say, Jesus! Is all they can say. That's the only prayer they feel able to, to pray. That's a powerful prayer. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. The name of Jesus. Because it's the name of the one who came into the world. The, came, the name of the one who gave himself for us. The name of the one who rose again from the dead. The name of the one who poured out his spirit upon us. The name of the one who is here right now with us. Jesus. And the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. It's not in my name, it's not in the name of the church. I, I've, to, I've told you the story about when I was, one of the early times in, in Ethiopia, I think it was my first visit there, I met this guy who was basically the general secretary of a huge denomination of millions of Christians. And he'd be, he was a Muslim. He brought up as a Muslim and, and he, he really was a Muslim, he believed it. He, he, was, he was a sort of evangelist, if that's the right word, for, for, for Islam. Uh, and he got to know this young fellow who was a nominal Christian. You know, he, he was, his parents were Christian, his grandparents were Christian. He never went to church, but he, he called himself a Christian. He said, I'll get this guy. Started, started really going to town with this guy. And then one Sunday, this guy went to church and got saved. And now... My friend, who was a good Muslim, you know, seeking to... So he's really troubling. He's right, he says, 
challenge you. You pray in the name of Jesus, and I'll get my friends together, and we'll pray in the name of Mahala, and we'll see you whose prayer works. They started to pray. And as they were starting to pray, one of the Muslims suddenly started to manifest demons. He, he got wild, and almost dangerous. And they, they, well, the Christian, this young guy, he's only been a Christian a month. He said, I don't know, you can cast demons out in the name of Jesus, I'm not sure you do it. He said, I've got a friend, I'll well, go and ask him. So several of these people went off to look for this Christian who, who he, he was a more mature Christian. He'd been a Christian for two months. But there was this guy who was going wild and my friend who was telling me the story, he was the one left wet behind with him. Well, this guy, the, the, got all, he grabbed on and he was, he was, you know, they were wearing a tie. And this guy, he's tied, he's pulling his tie. And the guy's choking. And he said, in the name of Muhammad, in the name of Allah. And then in desperation, in the name of Jesus. And the blow stopped. Now, all he could do was hold this bloke back in the name of Jesus <laughs> until, until the cavalry did arrive. <laughs> and this, this Christian, he'd been a, he'd been a, he was a mature, he'd been two months since he'd been a Christian. And he took authority. In the name of Jesus. And the demon was cast out. And my friend decided he'd better go to church. <laughs> and got saved. Now he's heading up a huge denomination with millions of Christians uh, all over Ethiopia. The name of Jesus is powerful. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. They conquered. It's talking about those who have conquered. Those who John in his vision is seeing in glory. They have conquered through the blood of Jesus of the Lamb. It's not what we do, it's what Jesus did on the cross. That is where we have authority. That's where we have power, that's where we have victory. It's what Jesus did when he hung on that cross and shed his blood. He conquered. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, we too can conquer. That's the Lamb of God was, was reference to the Passover. Remember at Passover, they were there in Egypt as slaves, and God sent the different plagues upon the Egyptians, and eventually the Pharaoh said, okay, you can go. Because the final plague, the final plague was the death of every firstborn child throughout the land, except for the people of God who sacrificed a lamb and took the blood of the lamb and painted it on the doorposts and on the lintel of their houses. And when death came through the land, it saw the, the blood on the doors of those houses and passed over. That's what Passover means. It passed over those houses. And the people were saved and they were able to go to freedom. The blood of a lamb. And Jesus said, I am the lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. I am the Lamb of God, and it's by the blood of the Lamb that you and I can have victory over the power of the enemy. And in that, that same scripture, Revelation 12, they conquered by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12, 10 to 11. By the word of their testimony. Your testimony is powerful. Now, it might not be dramatic. You know, every year we get Barry Woodward come in a preaching and he talks about his, you know, all the, the, the horrendous things he did and the drugs he was taking and all the wild and wacky things he got involved in. Uh, and, you know, God, isn't that impressive? And you think, well, my testimony is nothing. I remember quite some years ago now, I was on mission with George Millen. I can't remember where we were, but we were working in this little church and uh, come to the evening meeting, George said, Alan, share your testimony tonight. I said, George, my testimony is nothing much. No, oh, no, share your testimony tonight. So I shared my testimony. I was a young teenager in church, sat in the back row with the other teenagers, 
Kept a little note of how long the preachers preach for. <laughs> I actually made a discovery. Some of them who didn't preach very long could still board the pants off you. <laughs> and some of them who preached longer sermons actually were interesting. And you could, follow, you, you, you could sit and listen for longer. But I was there just, and then suddenly I, I heard the gospel, gave my life to Jesus. That night, there was a young teenager sat in the back row of the church. He'd been going to church all his life. Now, I don't think he had a diary keeping a note of the preach, but, but he heard my testimony. And my testimony spoke to him. Because where he was now is where I used to be. And my testimony spoke to him. Your testimony is powerful. Because your testimony says simply this. Satan, once upon a time, I was under your control, and now I've been set free. You lost. You lost. I know you lost because you lost in my life. And if you can lose in my life, you can lose in somebody else's life. Satan, I know you're a loser because I've seen the victory in my life. It may not be spectacular. It may not be dramatic. It might not make, you know, a video and a book and a film. But it's your testimony of how Satan lost the battle for your soul. And it's powerful. And you can conquer by the word of your testimony. And lastly, faith. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4. This is the victory that conquers the world. Our faith. Again, it's not faith in what we can do. It's not faith in what we've done in the past. Now, I mean, that can be very, it can be encouraging. It's a great encouragement sometimes to look back and look at what's done it, God's done in the past through you and think, hallelujah, that's great. But that's, that's not where the victory is. The victory is our faith in Jesus. We began with Jesus. We end with Jesus. Faith. These are the weapons, weapons that we've been placed, that have been placed at our disposal. Praise the Word of God, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, your testimony, faith in what Jesus did when he died on that cross and what he can do now. Confidence in him, commitment to him, faith. These are the weapons of our warfare. We're in a battle. We've got armor to protect us from attack, but we've got weapons to use to get in there, to take the battle to the enemy. Not wait for him to come and attack us, but to get out there in the name of Jesus and see victory. Amen.